Hello, I'm Katie Kavanagh, um, Senior Archivist at Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire Archives. Um, I mainly work with our Aberdeenshire collections at Old Aberdeen House. And I'm going to be doing an introduction to accessioning and cataloguing today. Um, so I'll be going through the accessioning process and running through cataloguing. Um, so that's sorting and weeding, arranging collections and the different tools you can use to organise um, your catalogues and the different fields you need to use in descriptions. So accessioning, what is it? So it's, we use the term to describe both the group of records that are transferred to an archive um, and the process of taking custody of the material. So I accession material when it comes into the archive and then an individual group of records that came in in one go are an accession as well. Um, and when you're accessioning um, material into your community archive, it's important to consider a number of things. So terms of deposit, um, is someone gifting it to you or is it a loan? Do they intend on taking it back? Um, are there any restrictions on use of the collection? Do they have the right to pass this material on to you? Is it owned by them? Should it go any should it go somewhere else? So um, if we in Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Archives are offered any church records, if they're Church of Scotland, they need to go to the National Records of Scotland down in Edinburgh, not us. Um, and similarly, we would hope that other local, local organisations, if they were offered school records, would recognise that they are owned by the councils and they need to come to um, the council archives. Um, and there's an easy way to check if anything is um, held where by um, using the National Arch the UK National Archives discovery tool. Um, if you go to the advanced search, you can check if there's any other records for a record creator elsewhere, and that just allows you to check um, if there's a if there's a collection of the organisation somewhere else. It might be better if they were all kept together in one place. This makes it much easier for researchers as well. And another thing to consider is, are the depositors happy for you to dispose of anything you don't want to keep? Or should this be passed back to them? And for oral history collections, do you have the necessary permissions from the interviewees as well as the depositors um, to make sure that you can use the, the use of recordings um, in the way you want to? So you'd have to make sure that there was an agreement with the interviewee giving you permission to hold the interview and allowing you to use it in publicity materials if you wanted, in exhibitions um, and for research. So all of this information um, should be recorded in an accession register and that means you've got a record of everything in your collections, where it's come from and what your rights are relating to it. Um, and this is sort of the bible of the collections because you might not have time to catalogue everything instantly so this will keep you right with what you've got at any one time um, and it can be electronic or on paper so we now have an electronic cataloguing system um, that includes an accession database as well but we used to have a paper record so this is an image of our old paper register um, and the sort of things you'd want to include are an accession number. So that would be given sequ sequentially as each new accession arrives. And you can use that to label the material until you've had time to catalog it. Um, a summary of what's in each accession, so you don't get confused between them. Um, the date it was received, the deposit terms, um, and details of who contact details for the depositor. Um, you might also want to do a more formal agreement with the whoever's deposited it with you, so you would keep that as well, um, just to confirm the terms of deposit. So moving on to cataloguing. So in archives, we advise or we want to catalogue according to provenance. Um, so that's where the items came from not by subject matter or type. So you don't want to 
grab different bits out of different um, accessions um, that are on the same topic um, because then you lose the context of where the records have come from. So you want to keep everything from the same provenance together. So you would keep records from all the same organisation. So if, example, this Ambridge Community Trust I've made up, you would keep any accessions to do with them in one collection. Similarly, individuals, you'd have a collection for each individual. And projects might also have a collection. There's an example of some of the collections in Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire Archives holdings here. So we've got different businesses, organisations, persons and families. Um, and each one would have a distinct um, collection. You wouldn't have bits about architecture from across businesses and organisations in one collection. It would be kept separate. Um, so once you've, you've, you're sticking with your provenance to keep the collection together, you would then try and do a box list um, and identify the material you want to keep and try and get a sense of what how you should arrange it. So a box list, you would number each box in the collection and then make a brief list of what's in that box. Noting anything you think it should be kept, any date ranges, if there's any personal data issues. So that's any um, records that would hold any personal information about living individuals. So we in Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Church, we would categorise that as within the last 100 years. And you have to, under data protection legislation, you have to be careful with how you provide access to that material. So it's important to make a note of what, um, where you find personal data. Um, you might also make a note if anything's duplicate. At this stage, you might want to remove metal fastenings and replace them with brass paper clips and do any other sort of preservation measures you can. So deciding what to keep and what not to keep uh, is always a challenge. We call it appraisal. Um, it's sorting the collection effectively. There's a really good resource on the Communities Archive and Heritage Group website um, from Leicestershire, Leicester and Rutland record offices um, about sorting collections. So I. Ideally, you want to keep records that will tell people what the organisation did and its values, how it operated and how successful or otherwise it was. So you'd be looking to get for an organisation signed minutes and accounts, annual reports and strategy documents, subject files that demonstrate the work of the organisation, membership lists, lists and case files potentially, publicity materials and photographs if there are any. Generally, you'd probably be looking to avoid keeping um, individual staff files and pay slips, um, receipts, invoices, till rolls, bills. They're quite low level financial information and they would normally be, um, the relevant data would be entered in a higher level document like a cash book or a ledger or the accounts ultimately. But if you haven't, don't have any other financial records for a collection, maybe you would have to rethink that. And we, I know we keep some receipts um, or orders when they've got very beautiful letterheads on them from the 19th century, because that gives you some idea of the business as well. Multiple copies of an item. As a rule of thumb, I wouldn't say don't keep more than three copies of anything. Um, because then you've got a preservation copy and an access copy and you could potentially use one in an exhibition if you needed to. Um, I also wouldn't, I would avoid keeping printed books and leaflets that weren't produced by the organisation because that can get, um, can fill up your stores quite quickly. Um, you might want to offer them to a local studies library potentially or another organisation. Um, if in doubt, you can always ask an archivist for advice. I'm sure um, um, any local authority archive would be happy to give you advice. Um, it's also important to note that some organisations, you would need to keep certain records for a certain length of time to comply with legislation of another sort. So financial records often need to be kept for seven years. So bear that in mind as well. 
So once you've got your box list, you can use it to identify groups of records and decide on an arrangement for your collection. So again, along with provenance, one of the key um, aspects of cataloguing for an archivist is trying to maintain the original order of the collection. So um, that can be difficult to discern, especially with personal papers for individuals. Um, but it probably be, for an organisation or business, it would be how the um, organisation organised itself. So which departments did it um, operate might be a good way of structuring it. And then you put the records for each department that were generated by each department under each in each um, sub part of the collection. But you could also do an arrangement by the type of records, so so minutes, financial records, or photographs, or by subject potentially. That's less common, I would say. So archive collections are arranged hierarchically um, to reflect the relationships between different parts of the collection. Um, so I've used this diagram to just sort of explain the hierarchy structure. So at the top, you've got the collection here. And that can be broken down into two series, um, the minutes and the accounts. And then underneath this minute series, there's the actual item in the collection, which is the minute, minute book itself and there's two minute books in this series and then in the account series there's a ledger and a cash book so underneath the collection there are two series and then in each series there are two items so that's the hierarchical structure and this is an example um, From our collections in the city archives so this is the um, norco the northern cooperative society collection so the collection as a whole there's 11 series in there there's minutes correspondence admin records scrapbooks poster books centenary cuttings financial records legal papers reports publications photographs plans and then miscellaneous And then this example is a set of personal papers in the um, archives collections. So that is broken down into press cuttings, maps, notes and papers, tourist and transport information. I think that's a couple of leaflets and some um, guides to the local area. And then some miscellaneous items. Uh, generally, we try and avoid using uh, miscellaneous as a series, but in some instances it is necessary. Um, and nowadays, if you use a computer based cataloging structure, if you do a keyword search, it would um, allow you to find anything. So it's not such an issue as it used to be when it's a paper structure and you wouldn't necessarily twig to look in the miscellaneous section. So how to do it in terms of cataloging, ideally, you would avoid using the word. So it's good to structure the information that you're going to record so there's a different field for each unit of description and that's structuring the data so you could use a spreadsheet like excel and um, a database and um, they're a bit more complicated to set up there's also cataloging software available so we use calm but there is a cost associated with that um, it's a propriety software so the software producers would charge you for using that um, but there is an open source software called Atom, which is used by the University of Strathclyde. And I've included an image of their um, catalogue, uh, online catalogue here on the side so you can see how that looks. What information to record in your catalogue? So as I was saying that you need to structure the data by fields. So we've got um, this five key fields here, um, reference number, title, date, extent and level. So that's, um, I've used some examples there, so the reference number would be Norco, the title would be a short summary of what the item is, so you'd 
might say Norco Minute Book. The date, um, now that could be just one, it could be the day, month, year, it could be a date range, so 1842 to 1855, it could be a century if you're not completely sure, it could be, you could put circa, if you again, if you're not completely sure. Um, we use ND for not dated if we're not sure what the date is at all, but it's best to put an estimate even if you're not entirely sure if it's accurate. Um, of a, if you're not entirely sure of a precise date. Um, extent, so that would um, be a volume or two files or a photograph and what level your description is for. So you would do this for each level of the hierarchy. So the collection would have this sort of information and each item would have this sort of information. You could also include um, description that expands on the information in the title field and you might state if there's any indexes or if there's a gap in the date coverage. Um, any access conditions, so data protection I mentioned earlier um, and any depositor requests associated with the collection. You could include some copyright information. Um, you might make a note of who catalogued the, the item or the collection, especially if there's a group of people working on one collection. Um, and if there is any alternative references, so if it's been catalogued before or if it had a reference number when it was with the originating organisation, again, that might be useful to record. At the collection level, um, I would also try and include these um, fields. So creator is would be key. Um, so that would either be the company, organisation, person, project or family that's generated the records and then you would provide more information on that person or company or organisation in the admin history field. Um, you could also include location at the collection level, so where you've put it in your stores. Um, the custodial history, so how it's come to be with you in your archive. Um, Index terms. In some instances, you might want to set up an indexing structure for your collections. Um, so that would allow you to search different collections um, on particular subjects, places or people. So you'd have to have a controlled set of um, index terms or you could use one of the ones that is available. Um, and I would also record accession number. And all of these would make sure you're complying with um, the international standard on archival description, which sets out which fields you should include in um, archive descriptions. So just to finish, we've got a few examples um, from our collections. This is the Inverbervie Borough collection. Um, so we've got up here the um, level. Um, so it's a collection level description, the reference number, Ooh, not using my highlighter very well, and then all the different accession numbers um, are below that, and the title of the collections here, the date range, the extent, and the alternative reference number, so that had been draft catalogued as with the reference BH8, so I've included that in there. Then we've got a section with the admin history about the history of the borough. The custodial history, so that's where the um, collection came from and it's coming in, as you can see, it's coming in 10 different accessions so it's where the history of the collections come from, where it's been held prior to coming to the archive. And then the description here, that just sets out which um, series are in the collection or sub-collections, I should say in this instance. Um, and then this is, you can see the fonts is at the top here. This is more of a table structure. The sub collection here, the series, um, and then all the different items in that first series, which is a minute book series. So you can see again that there's the um, reference numbers are here, and the levels, and then um, the titles and then these are descriptions and then dates and extents and this was all
dispatched into our cataloging software from a spreadsheet. So this is how it looked like in a spreadsheet form. So you can see it doesn't need to use a cataloging software to be functional. Um, and you can see how it's all been structured by the field. So the fields are the column headings um, and then each item or each record, so there's collection level entries in there as well, has a different row in the spreadsheet. So that's everything in my presentation today. Um, I would really advise looking at the Community Archives and Heritage Group website, particularly their cataloging guidelines. Um, they would be really helpful for any community archive, I would say. Thank you.